What's going on? It's your boy Sermon at Sermon's Domain on Twitter. This summer, I kind of rekindled my love for reading. I, I always like would read, but I try to do it daily now. So I really got back into reading books, you know, novels and comics and magazines and you know all kinds of stuff. I always read online, but I've always liked a good book, so I made it a goal to actually start reading more books. And so I am excited to share my thoughts on the autobiography of Gucci Mane. This is co-written with Neil Martinez Belkin. And, um, you know, he's a journalist that has been around for a while. He's worked at like XXL and a few other outlets. And this was like a really good opportunity. I feel like Gucci is in a space mentally where he can reflect on his life and talk about what he's gone through without feeling like it's like a fluff piece. It's not one of those things that's like, oh, Gucci is the best, Gucci's this, Gucci's that. No, he's able to look back and say, you know what? I made mistakes. I did this and I probably shouldn't have. Or I was wilding out back then. Like he's very self-reflective in a good way. Going into this book, I felt like I knew just a little bit about Gucci Mane. I feel like between the music and what you get on the internet, you know, like the legal issues or, uh, you know, the rare interviews here and there. Like, I knew a little bit about Gucci, but it was mostly, like, career-related. I didn't know anything about his personal life before he started making music. Obviously, I knew the fact that he was a hustler and, uh, you know, he was selling drugs and all that, but I didn't know, like, his real early years. I didn't know anything about his parents or his grandparents, but he outlines that very early in the book. And able to, you know, talk about growing up in Alabama for a while before ultimately moving to Atlanta. There's a lot of great stories in here. Like, you get to really experience it at all. The book itself, like the autobiography part, you know, chronicling his life is really only about 270 pages. But there is a lot that is talked about in those 270 pages. It feels like... Everything kind of moves fast, but enough to where you feel like you know about Gucci in that time period. You know, he starts out early, he goes through, uh, you know, middle school, and there's a little bit there, high school, and that's really where he starts, you know, getting into the hustling and all of that. And then before you know it, he's trying to be a rapper. Or more specifically, he was trying to be like Master P or Shoddy Low in that he was more of a front runner for another rapper and obviously that didn't work out he became the the rapper the the main attraction that's what he became but it's interesting to see like his views on on certain things a lot of us know that gucci has struggled with drugs over the years but in the early years when he was just hustling he didn't want to do any of that like he only started smoking weed because of a girl but besides that, he didn't really want to, like, get into it because he saw. He saw what, you know, Moving Bricks did to people. He saw, like, these people getting high and he didn't want to be in that same state of mind. He felt like he needed to stay clear of that. And so it's interesting, like, a contrast to see, like, what being in the dope game does to you mentally. And eventually you kind of just break down through stress, through all kinds of different situations and you know you can end up like the people that you're serving. Another thing that I really like about the book is that it ties a lot of like Gucci Mane's like music like lyrics to events in his life. The most uh, prominent version of that would be how in the past he's rapped about trapping out the Texaco. Him and OJ the Juice Man who actually go way back further than I thought you know, they were back then, you know, moving at that Texaco. And, like, he breaks down the story, talks about that, and then ties it into his lyrics. This is not, like, a decoded book like Jay-Z, but it's interesting that Gucci is able to tie in, you know, things that he's rapped about and how it, you know, affected him at the time and how it played into his life. 
You know, there's other instances I'm, I'm drawing a blank on, like, the exact moment. But I remember him talking about, you know, shooting someone and, you know, doing this and that. And so he's able to really put his real life into his lyrics. One of my favorite stories in the book was... In his early years, Gucci paid Juvenile for a feature. He was in Miami or Florida, some part of Florida, and they happened to meet up and everything. And this is like the, the days where like Young Buck was rolling with Juvenile. And so like he's mentioned in there too. But like, I won't spoil the entire story, but I thought it was interesting how Juvenile tried to kind of snake him out of what he was paying for. He tried to flip the script on him. And that kind of made like a little tense situation. And he talked about how eventually like, you know, years later he saw Juvenile again, but they didn't really speak about it. And so I thought it was a good story. I thought it was cool that Gucci was able to remember some of these numbers. Like for the Juvenile feature, he paid 7,500. And then he also talked about, I want to say this was before the Juvenile feature, but he was working at a Patchwork Studios in Atlanta and he ran into Bun B and Killer Mike who were, you know, big names at the time. And Gucci was coming off the success of Black T. He was working on a remix that eventually had a little scrappy on it. And I want to say there was someone else, but Bun B and Killer Mike decided they were going to get on the song and Bun B wanted 3500 and Killer Mike just wanted a grand. And so I like hearing like little stories like that because it's crazy how being at the studio on that particular day really changed the course of Gucci Mane. Like I'm not saying that Black T and the remix were like the biggest life changing things, particularly the remix. The, the original went everywhere according to the book, but I'm not saying the remix made his career or anything, but it's interesting how if he were to have been there hours earlier or hours later or not there on that particular day, like that remix in that capacity probably wouldn't have happened. I feel like I could talk about this book forever. Like this is one of the best hip hop autobiographies that I've read. It's up there with Prodigies, which is Probably the one that comes to mind when I think about my favorites. Like, Gucci is up there. I like that this entire book is not... It's not centered around trying to make Gucci out to be like this saint. Gucci owns up to his mistakes. And I love that the book really ends on a positive note. It also gives Gucci an opportunity to, you know, a few years later, write another autobiography. I think the success of this one is already speaking for itself. Everybody has been talking about how great this autobiography is. I don't know what the sales figures are, but Gucci's story is one that anybody should pick up. It doesn't matter if you're a huge fan, if you're, you know, semi-familiar with his music, or you flat out hate it. An interesting story is an interesting story, and that is what the autobiography of Gucci Mane is. So those are my thoughts on the autobiography of Gucci Mane. Let me know in the comment section if you plan on picking this up, if you plan on reading this one. And if you already have, let me know what your favorite part of the book was. Or, you know, your favorite parts. Talk to me in the comment section below. And then like the video, subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Share the video. Follow me on Twitter at Sermons Domain, and as always, thank you for your time. I appreciate you for watching, and until next time, peace.